And are you hungry? I haven't eaten since later this afternoon. Primer, the holy grail of time travel movies. A film so authentic in its portrayal of time travel that you practically need a PhD to figure it out. Now, I'm not here to explain Primer's time travel. I can't, I can barely even do basic algebra. But from the perspective of a dedicated cinephile, I find this movie utterly compelling. How did Shane Carruth mastermind such a captivating film on a mere $7,000 budget with a script that barely fleshes out its characters and refuses to give the audience any easy answers? Well, let's dive in. Anything? This normal? I don't know. I'm turning it off. Wait. The film follows two engineers, Aaron and Abe, who develop experimental trinkets in their spare time. One of their engineering buddies, Robert, introduces them to a concept that, in execution, should reduce an object's mass. After some unsuccessful experimenting, Abe figures out that when the device is activated and separated from the outside world via a metal box, mold accumulates at an unprecedented rate. He takes his findings to a lab, where the biologist thinks he's telling a joke. This amount of growth should not occur in such a short span of time. This leads Abe to design a much larger box, which he puts in a storage facility. It's at this moment he realizes it's a time machine. He lets Aaron in on their findings, but instead of publishing, they decide to continue their experiments. They want to figure out what their finding is worth before they sell it off. Up to this point, the movie is fairly easy to follow. Sure, Shane does obscure things with the hyper-realistic engineer lingo and his quick-cut, minimalistic visual stylings, but there is actually a lot of exposition that's pretty easy to follow if you turn your brain on. But unlike exposition in other science fiction films, this stuff is handled marvelously. Check out how Shane conveys that Aaron managed to get the energy source for the box working. Uh, we can get some tacos on the way, um, or we can get a steak afterwards. What are you talking about? I'm not paying for a steak. It's stable. Aaron is stable. When tasked with portraying the development of Abe's findings, most writers would probably default to showing him actually making the findings. Shane doesn't do that. Instead, Abe makes all of his findings off screen. What Shane does show us is Abe recreating his discoveries so Aaron can experience the same elation he did when he was making them. It's pretty hype. It makes the pacing tighter. It injects tons of levity. It depicts the dynamics between the two characters to a T and it gets you really excited to see what Abe discovered. The way Shane writes it, each scene gets more and more crazy until you reach the climactic moment where Aaron sees a duplicate of Abe walk out of the storage facility. Who's that, eh? Perfect. This might be more of a personal taste thing, but I love movies that are authentic to real life. While some of the overlapping dialogue and natural lighting is a bit clunky, when it works, it makes the world of the movie feel real and lived in, with a history and a personality behind it. I love how all the engineers are talking in this scene and Aaron's wife is just casually doing dishes in the background. Even if I don't get all the technical jargon and science talk, I never feel like it's bad or inauthentic. This is how people really talk. We also get some clues in this first half to the movie's big twist. Uh, where are you going? What do they do with engineers when they turn 40? How'd you get over here? You know what they do with engineers when they turn 40? They take them out and shoot them. Part two is where it starts getting wacky. If none of the stuff from part one has you engaged in this movie as I am, then part two is not gonna be fun for you. But if you're on board with it, come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Okay, I was with the film. I was on board with everything. I know you do. Now my brain is, is just, nice. it's just deflated. At first, the two use the time machine to experiment. They anticipate the stock market, bet on sports games. You know, what you would do if you had a time machine. They take careful precautions not to interact with their past selves in fear that it could instigate a paradox. What's most interesting in this section of the film, however, is how the two characters react to their discovery. Abe is apprehensive and takes careful steps to make sure nothing goes wrong. He hopes that everything goes smoothly, implying that he thinks time is set in stone that destiny and fate exist, and that they've already made the choices they're going to make. At one point, he does deny this, but contrasted to Aaron, his viewpoint is clearly more conservative. To make it simple, Abe believes in the time travel of 12 monkeys, while Aaron believes in Back to the Future. Aaron is actively depressed by the idea that everything has already been predetermined, and even though he isn't willing to risk a potential paradox, he does secretly want one to happen, which would prove that causality is real and free will does exist. We can see this clearly in his reaction to this sports game. What? What? We're, we're supposed to win this by two. They just turned over with, with 12 on the clock. Uh, we, we, we have to foul. No. We, no, we have to foul. Well, no, we, we foul here. 
I missed the first free throw. They come back with a three. That's right. That's right. We also see Aaron propose the idea that he can go back in time and correct mistakes in the past, only to have Abe shut him down. This idea that Aaron is living his life over and over again and making the same mistakes every time haunts him, and his paranoia only continues to ramp up in the film's final third. Before we go further, I should probably explain one small thing. The machine only lets you go as far back as you have set it, so they can't go back to like the 1800s and live out their Victorian fantasy, but if they set the box the day before, they can get in and come out whenever they set it. There's a character in the film named Rachel, who's a love interest of Abe's, and whose father, Thomas Granger, is a potential investor in the two's invention. One of Rachel's ex-boyfriends shows up at a party and nearly kills her. This is where the movie gets unnecessarily oblique. Shane doesn't show the altercation, which is fine, but when Abe gets mad at Aaron about it, we don't really understand why until later in the film. Aaron was at that party. He was the one who saved Rachel, and he's also the person who invited the ex. I'm not sure why Shane doesn't show the party. This is part of the film that's not confusing because of the time travel, but rather Shane's direction, or possibly budgetary restrictions. I don't know. It's getting messy. Let's move forward. Remember how I said that Aaron secretly wants a paradox to happen? Well, he gets his wish granted to him when he takes his phone back in time, knowing that his wife was supposed to call. With his present self receiving the call, it prevents his past self from getting it, effectively altering history. But but hey, the universe doesn't explode. <laughs> with evidence that paradoxes won't affect their present selves, the two decide to get riskier with their experiments. Though there is still a worry that if they prevent their past selves from entering the box, it could lead to a world with multiple versions of themselves, which could be just as bad. To keep such a thing from happening, Abe had a failsafe box set up beforehand, which was activated the day he told Aaron about time travel. This way, if something goes horribly wrong, Abe can just go back and reset everything. One night, the two are woken up by a bunch of skater kids setting off all the car alarms in their neighborhood. Abe proposes that the two go back and scare the kids away so their past selves can get some sleep. Leaving the house, they spot Thomas Granger sitting outside the house in his car. Aaron notices that his facial hair has changed drastically. Abe calls Rachel and has her put Thomas on the phone, proving that this unshaven Thomas must be a time traveler. The two chase him down and knock him out. They try to figure out how he might have time traveled and which one of them would in the future let Thomas in on it. Abe determines that the experiment is too chaotic to go forward with and decides to use the failsafe. He goes back to the day he told Aaron about the time machine and sedates his former self so that he never talks to him. Now remember, Abe is obsessed with keeping everything the same. Everything needs to be controlled. So he goes down and talks to Aaron, this time knowing what mistakes he's made and how to prevent them from happening. He tries to recreate the conversation from that morning, but he can't remember everything. Despite this, Aaron repeats the conversation verbatim. I don't even know what. She's tired. I hope you're not implying that any day is unimportant to Cortex Semi. Even though his responses no longer make sense. Then we get Shyamalan. It's twist time, baby. Abe collapses from fatigue and we realize the little earpiece that Aaron has been using is actually a recording of all the events from that day. In Aaron's words, Through that earpiece, he had a three second lead on the world. Aaron actually folded up one of the boxes and brought it with him through Abe's failsafe to make his own duplicate, which he used way before the Thomas Granger incident to go back and make himself the hero at Rachel's party. At this point, everything is fucked. There's like three errands, two waves, two Grangers, four errands, six errands, there's like two errands, like seven two errands, like two errands, like errands, like errands, like errands, like errands, like errands. I know, that's fantastic. So when Abe used the failsafe in the present, Aaron did as well. Aaron went back to try and stop his past self from sedating his past past self so that the Rachel timeline wouldn't get screwed and Granger wouldn't use the time machine. Which he presumes is because something bad happens to Rachel in the future. Okay. We're getting lost here. Aaron, original Aaron, the one who Abe told about time travel was actually a time traveler Aaron who pre-recorded conversations of that day so he could go back and give himself a three second lead on the world. The other Aaron, the original, original Aaron was sedated by this Aaron so he could save Rachel at the party. Now, the failsafe Aaron has gone back and given the original Aaron the recording and told him to his face that he has to get rid of the X for good. Otherwise, Rachel might be killed in the future and Thomas Granger will be sent back in time to save her. With this knowledge, original Aaron goes to the party, takes out the X along with failsafe Abe. While they're doing this, failsafe Aaron has gone off to hide and doesn't interfere anymore. Failsafe Aaron is also the one leaving a non-diegetic voice message throughout the entire film. Original, original Aaron is locked in his attic as the sedatives wear off off, he finally breaks out. The film ends with failsafe Abe telling original Aaron of his intention to stay in town and make sure that the two never invent time travel, and original Aaron leaves the US to continue his experiments elsewhere. The final scene of the film is either failsafe Aaron or original Aaron, it isn't specified, directing foreign workers to begin constructing on a new warehouse-sized box. <sighs> okay, so that's the basics. 
there's a lot of shit I didn't even go over. One theory as to why their handwriting suffers so badly can be traced back to the day Aaron and Abe are playing around with the box in the garage before any time travelling has taken place. They both place their hands above the box and in that moment, their hands may have travelled back in time while the rest of their Wait, bodies remained what? in the present. As a result, their hands may be a few moments behind Whoa! the rest of their- Save for some unnecessarily confusing presentational aspects, I find this to be an incredibly compelling film. Its unabashed complexity and core thematic conflict give it so much more artistic focus than any of its contemporaries. It's not a pulpy sci-fi thriller about two engineers discovering time travel. It's an examination of what people will do in the face of its limitless power. The conflict between Abe and Aaron is indicative of left versus right brain. One is cautious and linear, the other is emotional and abstract. In Caruth's vision, Aaron's paranoia over his free will is what breaks everything, and it's Abe's caution that prevents him from being on top of it. Aaron's goal in the film is to prove that predetermination isn't an aspect of reality. He's desperate to be the master of his own fate. We all are. As sentient, thinking human beings, the concept of choice and free will not existing is existential nightmare fuel. By altering the events of the party, Aaron is attempting to prove that he can alter events in the past without changing the present. Paradoxical as it may be, he is the master of his own reality. This is a concept that is terrifying for Abe. If time travel only affects the past, then hypothetically, his reality could be intruded on at any given moment. Potentially, a future Abe could travel back to kill himself in the past and assume his whole life. Primer is a parable about the ethical implications of time travel. The only one who can control it is the person who can go the furthest back, which by the end of the film, it's Aaron. The final scene sees him fulfilling the needs of his god complex. To use the Back to the Future analogy, when Marty McFly goes back and changes the past, he's actually creating a new timeline and erasing the other, effectively killing everyone in it. Our characters don't experience the paradox, but unless something interdimensional is going on, it has essentially been snapped out of existence. At that point, what even is reality? If our world is at the mercy of the person who can go the furthest back, then it must be asserted that we are only existing through Aaron's subjective reality. As maddening and confusing as much of the film's plot is, this core theme is incredibly compelling and executed with a level of intelligence that very few, if any, other stories ever achieve. I don't return to Primer so often because of its realism, or its style, or even its main characters. I return to Primer because its implications are so obsessively disturbing. There's also so many cool details to pick up on every time I watch it. That ringing phone in the opening scene. Part of me wonders if that's failsafe Aaron leaving the message we hear throughout the film. But maybe I'm just being paranoid. What if you, what if you traveled back in time and like, had sex with yourself? Any of that. Wait a minute. 